With that, I am so absolutely thrilled and honored to introduce to you today our speaker who is going to be discussing narrative authority, moral injury, and pathways to well well-being. Her name is Famida Hussein. And through this interactive and upbeat discussion with PhD candidate and certified healthcare ethics consultant, participants will come to understand the concept and breadth and forms that moral injury can take. The intent is to see the significant difference between the commonly used term burnout and moral in injury. In addition, we'll have an opportunity to learn how moral injury often deeply affects many different areas of our life and not just work. Famida is a PhD candidate, like I mentioned, a certified healthcare ethics consultant and a pivotal contributor to NARDS. She is completing her dissertation and will graduate in spring of 2022. Famida's vision is to place narrative and storytelling as a lived and practical means to positively influence health best care practices improvements through an innovative approach she calls narrative authority, a method to change what she describes as thoroughly other-oriented, dialogue-based, culturally sensitive, non-judgmental, and always story-dependent. Famida is passionate about women and gender issues and recognizes the role that the unquestioned assumptions play in providing excellent care. Her ideas have been noted and presented in a number of notable journals and international conferences. In addition, she was recently awarded the prestigious 2021 McNulty Dissertation Fellowship Award for her significant research in her field. And this is a, this is a topic uh, that is very close to my heart. Um, for the longest time, I thought I might've been recovering from burnout. I came to realize I was actually recovering from moral injury. And so I'm so grateful to hand over the floor today to Famida to explain what this is and how we can find some of those pathways to well-being. So just passing it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. And um, as I was hearing you, I was like, oh, that's all me? Great. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you. And uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. So let me tell you something that I do in my life, which makes me who I am. Uh, so I'm a mother, an ethicist, a change agent, an artist, and most importantly, I'm a person with quite a few imperfections and weaknesses. I can be really mean and ignorant, trust me. And um, don't get fooled by my hijab because that doesn't make me, I mean, it looks like sane, but I'm not. And you know what, like I, like, I'm living with all of my imperfections and those do make me struggle in my world. Now, why am I saying this? I thought you should know this because as you start to hear me and everything I'm gonna tell, I do try those to myself. So today we will discuss moral injury and how it relates to you and offers pathway to your wellness. So, and we'll see how a traumatic even inflict moral injury. And if we do not recognize that, then we are not acknowledging the severity of the situation or the traumatic event that we go, go through or continue to experience in our life. So in this platform, you have heard other speakers and everyone is giving you different ways to help you think, right? They have offered a wide variety of excellent coping strategies and healing strategies. Now for you, some make sense and some didn't, which is absolutely normal. In fact, I mean, that's how I think, if you see that you can apply all of them or like most of them, that you have heard uh, in this platform, I think that is certainly a red flag <laughs> because this can never happen. This is insane and impossible because we all are unique. All our situations are very different. And I know 
like if some there are something that might work best for me, but might be the worst thing you have ever tried. So it's not possible that everything other people is going to say is going to work for you. But what we all accept that we all have in common is that we all recognize that we have struggles and have experienced pain, discomfort, confusion, fear, anger, and exhaustion, right? Our looking for a solution makes it clear that we, we know we want to heal, but in our own way, that feels like our, like just mine, it's me. So here I am to suggest that knowing your story will help you to see and understand what best for you, what works exactly best for you. Uh, why most people cannot embrace a healing strategy is that they are uncertain about their story. They don't know themselves. Therefore, people are uncertain about what will work for them. Because I don't know myself, how do I know what's going to work for me? And just because they don't know like what's going to work for them, they cannot make the future they imagine to happen. Now, what you'll be hearing from me in the next uh, 30 minutes is that it is okay to be who you are. But there is a but. And the but is that you can only claim to be okay when you understand yourself and your own story. And I believe the only way we can know yourself, we can know about ourselves is by knowing our story. Now, before I go further, I would like to thank you. Thank you for what you have done and are still doing and giving. My dear friends, you have given your best. You have done great work in the face of everything and you're still working, giving and trying your best to help each other and respect each other. Now your presence in this world is a blessing. I share my heartfelt respect and love for each of you and hats off. Most of us have very little idea of your own unique situations and struggles and what you have gone through. Almost everyone in our world only can see the tip of the iceberg. It's because either they're not really looking to it are more likely the tip is all you are allowing them to see, right? We don't allow everyone to see us. So, okay, so this is the article that created the bond between you and me. I'm glad that the people at Shri Recovers Foundation uh, found this article meaningful. And the reason I jumped into, the, into writing this article is because I could see what was going wrong having been onto the floor, talking to a colleague, friends, physicians and nurses in my direct family during COVID-19. At that time, I was broken hearted and I needed to raise my voice. I saw COVID causing us moral injury and understood the urgency of self-care if we are going to survive and to be healthy. But I also know many were hesitant to admit, the, admit that this medical encounters as moral injury. And for most part, the term moral injury has been confined within the war and particularly for the military people. Now I argue that there are situations where we found ourselves which are equally traumatic as war. Like COVID-19 is a war situation. And similarly, there are other situations in our lives are also like a war, which others have no idea about. 
Now, uh, as I'm going further, I would like to share a personal story with you. This has nothing to do with COVID. And uh, the reason behind sharing the story is how traumatic an incident can create a moral injury. So this is something that I recently experienced. So I was invited by a friend uh, to be a part of their journey while they gave birth to their baby boy. I was there, but the situation turned out much differently than anyone expected as, the, as that turned out to be a preterm labor. The baby was born too early and died within a few minutes. I remember holding the baby who died in my arm. His name was Ishmam, and I still remember every tiny details of him, like his nails, his nose, which was uh, exactly like his mother. So now the background uh, is the parents lost their baby at, the, at their fifth month of their pregnancy uh, because of the short cervix. Now, for two weeks before the baby died, the parents had known that uh, they are probably gonna lose their child as the mother start to bleed. The mom knew that there is a way to stage the cervix. And that means you close the cervix so the baby won't be forced, uh, I mean, would be forced to stay in the warm womb. But uh, that didn't happen because it was her first pregnancy and there was no guarantee it, it would save the baby. The doctors were hesitant to do the procedure also because it was her first pregnancy and they wanted to make certain that uh, she could get pregnant again without any um, complication onward, which is absolutely a fair call. But after she lost her child, uh, my friend went to a deep trauma. She believed she should have made the doctor or she should have asked the doctor to stitch the cervix. But what the doctor did, the doctor worked in the best interest of the patient. They assured her that this happened to many people. But for my friend, she thinks this is her valuable pregnancy, her baby. How could she not? Now she can't forgive herself for not being more forceful and demanded the cervix stitching procedure. She blames herself for not doing everything possible. And this is a traumatic experience and she is continuously questioning her compassion and judgment. She find it almost impossible to be merciful to her. Even if she laugh loud in the moment, she thinks she is being selfish bad mother who's laughing, having the smallest enjoyment after losing a child. Now, the more I see her, I talk to her, I know she is in a state of moral injury. Even though there are medical problems, I mean, there were medical problems and rationally she knows it was not her fault, but this hurt her to the soul. This compelled me, and I'm ready to call many situations of trauma as moral injury. Now, now, it's a good thing that nowadays moral injury is widespread than previously acknowledged, and this fact must be emphasized. And regarding this particular um, photo that you're seeing, this is a real one. So uh, when I asked permission from my friend that can I really share uh, uh, her story uh, with you guys? Then she gave me the per permission and I asked her for a photo and this is uh, what she gave me. And this is what Ishmael was wearing when um, we were holding him. Okay. So <clears throat> what is moral injury? Some of you maybe know like what it is. Some of you may not. So here are some definitions of moral injury, but for today, I would ask you to focus on the third definition. So what is moral injury? Moral injury is a deep soul wound 
that pierces our person's identity, sense of morality, and relationship to the society. So this is going to make you think. So if you slow down and read this over and over as I have, you will see how many incidents in our life should be considered as moral injuries. To see them as something lesser makes the healing much harder. This is what I think. Now think about COVID-19. During COVID, frontliner had to take on multiple roles simultaneously, conducting screening process, attending to the critically ill, deciding triage protocols, contacting, updating families, uh, becoming surrogate families to a dying patient, informing the family of the death of the loved one, and so on and so forth. So all these nurses, physicians and other affiliated people have seen their patients dying. Like some of the physicians and nurses had to leave their patients unattended to care for the others. Now, all of these had extreme effect on their mental health. And so by being on this battlefield, COVID, they are going through moral injury. Some people may disagree, but I would stick to that. The standard argument is that moral injury can only occur from a wartime experience. And I say, no. Uh, they say that the medial arena is completely different. But those critics were not with the frontliner on the floor during COVID-19. Not there with you during your struggle. They don't understand what happened and what will continue to happen to us. The gravity and the complexity of COVID-19 crisis and many of our personal life incidents have made it clear that there is no distinct difference between a battlefield and a normal situation. So similarly, many of us has experienced moral injuries and these events are happening and we have to be mindful about it and we have to accept that like what my friend has gone through, is going through, is a moral injury. Now, potentially more, <clears throat> potentially morally injurious events are the cause of this moral injury. So think about the story I shared about baby Ishmael. This incident led to a severe moral injury to the mother. The mother cannot forgive herself because she didn't force the doctor to stitch her cervix. She believes Ishmael would have been viable if he had stayed in the womb for two more weeks. So she perceived, so her perceived inaction is crawling her everyday life. She keeps thinking over and over that if she had done that she could have saved her baby. She believes she had committed a crime and this is called perpetration. At the same time, she also fe feels betrayal because she believes that the doctor could have saved her child. So her remorse is consuming her and she blames herself and the doctor for Ishmael's death. And if not handled with care, her trauma could haunt her for the rest of her life, right? So here are some common response that happens when someone faces high level of moral injury. And I suspect uh, many of us will recognize this. So when you face moral injury, you start to, to critique yourself. So it's a high self-criticism situation. They start, they start to criticize themselves, ask this, themselves questions which are very targeted and can like uh, very negative as well. And they try to dig deep into that to get the answer. And like at some point they cannot get the right answer and they start to criticize themselves. So after they start, they do, criticize themselves, so that criticism breaks them. And then they come to a point of low self-compassion. The self-criticism creates low self-compassion and it gives them a feeling that they did wrong. And that brings them down. 
down the loss i mean the loss and um all that they're thinking that what that creates is that they lose their self worth and they stop stop loving themselves and once they stop loving themselves there's a guilt and shame associated with that the lower level self compassion builds guilt and that guilt continuously bombard and as this happen they cannot work properly because they are traumatized uh, and the fear and they have the fear of being judged so all this hamper their everyday life and daily operational ability and when they fail to act due to all of this they develop the fear of being judged which is dangerous already because they by that time they know that they cannot perform at their best and gradually they start to think like oh people are judging me and this is how we allow other people to define who we are and then we tend to run away from who we are and who we want means that she didn't do her best she allowed her son to die and now she thinks if she smiles or laugh people are going to judge her almost all of us can relate to this in some way right and um how and how you can relate like how this continuously spiral downward then what do we do and we are actually harming ourselves by doing this this self harm may not be like physical harm may not be like you're harming yourself uh, by beating yourself or something like that but it's like more about um a different type of harm that we do to ourselves by probably eating overeating or not eating by self medicating via alcohol or with prescription drugs by maybe sleeping a lot or maybe by not sleeping and sometimes not even leaving the house we tend to isolate ourselves and this list goes on what it comes down to is trying to distance ourselves from the pain and the shame which takes the form of distancing ourselves from people who love us and those who are trying to help us to heal now before i go farther i just want to make certain that you are aware of the distinction between moral injury and burnout because we often time you we use the word burnout uh, and most certainly most of us are very familiar with the word burnout than moral injury so burnout is a state of emotional physical and mental exhaustion created by excessive or prolonged stress and it occurs when we feel that we are overwhelmed uh, emotionally drained and unable to meet the consistent demands whereas moral injury is almost the same thing but it is like an extended version of burnout in moral injury people try to do self harm actively like when you are burnout you try to do self harm but in moral injury you become more actively uh, start to harm yourself and the intensity is more and also the period is longer so to us we think uh, self harm is suicide or cutting ourselves but as i told you a few minutes back is that self harm is beyond that in fact not finding way to love yourself is self harm not understanding your story not understanding yourself is self harm in fact not putting the due importance to a situation is also self harm so you see uh, these exposures are like far beyond more like uh, burnout so i think it is important that we accept and acknowledge the breadth 
and the scope of moral injury. And this is more like more beyond burnout because you not only dried up, but you actually spiral like downward. And this doesn't need to be an actual war. It can be, it can happen with any of us anytime. Okay, so now, now what? What do we do? How do we respond to the injury? Or how do we survive? Or how do we heal? To heal, I suggest that we need to embrace our stories, which gives us access to our moral resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience is accepting your new reality, even if it is less good than the one you had before. It is not a compromise, but it's, 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 it's more about an acceptance. And it is, also, it is our story-driven way to respond to a difficult situation in ways that we might not have done otherwise. Now, how do you respond to something that you have never expected or have faced before? Or to something that spiraled downward and then you seem to stuck in one place? Now, how do we do that? First, it means accepting the change has occurred. I, I don't want to be sound insensitive when I'm saying that, that accept the change has occurred because when you go through something really traumatic, I mean, you don't want to accept that, but can we go back? Can we change our situation? Can we like work on the past? No, what we have is our present and our future. So, this is where we find ourselves. So the first thing we have to do is accept the change. Much of it we may not like, or we keep wishing things would return as they were before everything happened. But we all know that there is no return. And it may be sound easy to say, but, but, we know that if something happens, I mean, there is no way to go back. But does it mean that our life will stop there? No, it doesn't mean life can't take on new positive or fulfilling pathways. So yes, it is hard to say that I am in this situation and this is mine. It, it is not a general phenomenon, I know. I am going through this, but given this, it's okay to act in a weird manner because we are working on ourselves right now. It's okay to admit that we are struggling and it's okay to find someone or look for someone who would hear your untold shouts and unseen tears. So it's okay to say, Bear with me, I can fall short, but I'm doing my best and I'm getting there. Now, but if you think that you want to prove yourself after you, uh, you had a moral injury or you, you're going through a moral injury, if you want to prove yourself that, that, that you are healing from a trauma, but you don't give your space to fail while working on the healing process, you're doing wrong to yourself. It's okay to fail. And we all will fail. And there is, because there is no overnight fix. There is no quick fix. You cannot deny the worst or the past. So healing is not a race with the world where you need to be proved or validated. This is your pathway to become you and imagine who you want to be. It's all yours. You become, when you become resilient, when you give yourself the time and that time you actually start the healing process. So once we become resilient, we come to a point of healthy adaption. But to make the adoption sustainable, we need to nurture it. My answer to that is we can nurture it by doing self-care. 
because self-care can lead to the process of healing. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, you need to trust your own resilience and we must adopt a meaningful self-care strategies. Because remember, with low emotional reserve, it is difficult to perform at your best. When we are off our game, we have greater likelihood of making mistakes and missing opportunities. Now, the goal is to create a safe place to embrace and trust our resilience. And for that, again, it's okay to be emotionally vulnerable. One important practice we need to overlook during any, any crisis or any, any trauma is perfectionism. Perfectionism, I mean, it must be cast aside. This is very important because perfectionism is unattainable and only can lead us to unrealistic expectation. So as we go through the process of healing, we cannot be perfect. In fact, it's a foolish act to try to be perfect. Trust me. Okay. Uh, now that we know that we need to do self-care, for our healing process, now how do we do that? How do we get ourselves engaged? How do we get motivated? The answer to that is get attuned to your guiding power of your own narrative and your own story. And when you do that, you find meaning and hope. You recognize what is important in your life. And in doing so, you embrace your identity. And as, as we start to embrace our identity, we begin to understand ourselves better. We own who we are and who we want to be. And in doing this, we open ourselves to self-care and self-love. You find ways to fall back in love with yourself. Now ask yourself, who am I? What answers are you getting? Do you actually know who you are? When you can say with clarity that this is who I am, this is what I do, this is why I do it, and this is the purpose of my life, and this is why this is, like, it is important to me, then you know that you know yourself. That is when you know that who you are and who you want to be and have a good sense of your identity. So I'm suggesting that you must own all of these other component of your story. Own it. The pathway to healing and the future becomes better by keeping all of the components of your life close to you. Stay engaged in this. Otherwise, you neglect your story and your identity fades unspoken. And when you do that, your world shrink. You neglect what can and will make your life and so good for you and those who are around you. So part of moral injury actually occurs because we became so overwhelmed and with, with the situation and the situation becomes so demanding that we are pulled away from many of the things that is meaningful to us. I'm asking you to pull all those things back to you, bring them close to you, to trust your story. And when you do so, you will see how re-engaging your beliefs, hopes open you up to the beginning of self-care. Knowing your strength, and your challenges, and then be realistic. Imagine your future and understand what you need to get there in the light of the past experience. Or then we cannot avoid our past. What we can only do is learn from our past and move on. It, um, again, I'm not being insensitive, but we have to move on. And in order to move on, we have to accept that something had happened. 
and some past, uh, like um, because of our past, maybe some ways uh, get closed off. But so what? We can always reshape our future if we want to. Now, when you understand your identity, you get to work on your story. Then you can tell your story. And this will allow you to articulate your desired future. And based on that, you'll, uh, you'll shape your beliefs and the wisdom of past experience will help you to get to a certain point. And this gives sense making to what and why and what do you do and give yourself the intention to what you want to do. Now, always remember you, you are what you do. That's who you are. So like myself, uh, like who I am, like I, as I start, started by saying that I'm an ethicist, but why am I an ethicist? Where did that come from? So, and why did I choose to be an ethicist? I want to be an ethicist because of my brother's death. My brother died to a misdiagnosis and I wanted to make sure that I do something to prevent this from happening to others. So I, would, I ask you to know yourself, ask yourself all the questions and try to find out the meaning from it. What is that you do? What is the reason for doing it? Why it is important to you? and how it's meaningful to you. So ask yourself all the questions and try to find out the answer for those. And once you find out the answer for those, you get to be more attuned to your story, trust me. So here is, uh, by the way, what's the time? I hope I'm not. Okay, so, okay, let me speed up a little bit. So here is what I have been saying so far. And this is your single slide takeaway is our story gives rise to meaning and the meaning shows us the significance of our lives. And that clarifies the thing that creates us and what, and what you want to be and who you are. Thus you understand what you need, your need then drives to self-care. And as you start to self-care, you open yourself up from boxed up and make you resilient. And as you get resilient, that takes you back to your story and your resilience then became, and as you are resilient because you're trusting your story. And when you see this, you know that you're trying to break uh, a loop that you are in. And if you can break it, this is a continuous, never ending loop. So this is what narrative authority is, because you heard that term in the, in the beginning and my presentation, that narrative authority. Now, what is that? Whatever I said so far is, is, is what narrative authority is. This is actually a theory that I'm developing and it is all that I have been talking so far. So narrative authority is a place where narrative and storytelling is a lived means to understand person to person encounter. And it is a tool and a method that put emphasis on narrative. The hope is to integrate the importance of narrative in our everyday encounter. And I'm using the word authority particularly here because I want to make certain that we give power to our narrative. Now, how do you practice narrative authority? With three things, engage presence, which means being with, this means you understand your story, which allows you to respond to a situation better and more authentically in the moment. Then close reading, which is listening to, that this allows you to listen to the other stories. And as you listen to the other stories, this reinforce you to tell your own story. And the third one is lived experience. And this helps you to analyze the situation from living with it. Like if you hurt some, have somebody's pain, you start to leave the pain and helps you to be resilient to change where we are. So it means like embrace the now. And by doing so, uh, with the help of the tools that I explained in narrative authority, we all need to work on ourselves to do self-care. We need to be kind to ourselves rather than judging ourselves. For example, it's not my friend's fault, rather she has done her best. She, th that is destined and no one could change that. 
So be kind to yourself, love yourself, do not isolate yourself from others. Even if you are betrayed by some, you must understand that there are other people in the world who love you, who want to help you on the pathways to healing. We need to be mindful about our problems and our surroundings. As we own the situation, then we need to be mindfully handle how we can make it better. We need to embrace the problem, live with it. Again, I'm not being insensitive. We have to live with the problem. We have to love what we have gone through as they taught us something. Maybe it's very traumatic, but, may, but we, we would, I mean, we should be in a mindset that maybe we have learned something from it. Every situation, every trauma teaches us something. And to learn the teaching, we need to embrace the situation. Stop overpowering your thoughts. Rather, learn from it, defeat them, and give light to your story. Your story gives you hope to see the bright future. And as you do so, please make sure for your better future, you forgive yourself. If we want to heal, we have to forgive ourselves for the mistakes. Be merciful to yourself. From there, we can trust our stories and create a future with meaning and light. But in this doing, do not compare yourself with others. Let not anyone define you with their judgmental language. It's your life, your dream, and only your absolute present, presence and light can make it better. Your story is your guide. And finally, friends, Remember, you are not responsible for any insanity or pains or the trauma that have come to you in your life. Let's just ensure that our stories are told and that we live with compassion, collaboration, and cooperation. We have knocked down by life, taken out by tough time and challenges, but we will come back stronger than ever through patience, strength, and determination. And our stories are our guide opens ourselves to healing, but please, please, please practice self-compassion, self-love, and this is the only way to heal the wound and recover. This is all I have for you. I'm sorry, Lisa, did I go over time? You did, but it was absolutely necessary because everything that you have to share, you know, these three major components um, are so integral to this experience. So. I'm incredibly grateful. And I first have to say, I absolutely love that you introduce yourselves as what I would say is some like shortcomings <laughs> or liabilities. Like that's my favorite thing to do is say, hi, I'm Lisa and I'm recklessly optimistic about my time. So it was such a wonderful way to, to ground and have an icebreaker at the beginning for you to share transparently what some of those, you know, different aspects of you are. So thank you for bringing that transparency forward. And um, I do have to say from a, on a personal note, the story that you told about your friend is, is 100% my story. The exact same thing happened to me. And so I, I just want, want you to know that throughout the session, we're holding them, we're honoring them in this experience. And I'm so deeply grateful um, that they took the time to, to share such a courageously vulnerable, vulnerable story because I know that there are other parents, women, caregivers that are healing from a very similar thing that may not be able to recognize, right, that, that this is a moral injury, and, and the wound does run very deep. Um, and that that quote that you brought forward is also my favorite quote. And so I just feel like we're just on some kind of wavelength today, because when I heard that definition, right, of, of this deep soul wound, that purse that pierces a person's identity, sense of morality and relationship to society, resulting from witnessing actions or needing to act perhaps in ways that violate an individual's deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. When, when I heard that, I realized that I wasn't just recovering from burnout, right? I was recovering from moral injury. And, and it did impact as many people who are probably watching impact many different aspects of my life, right? Like you mentioned, it doesn't just happen at work, but it started for me at work. 
that's when I started to recognize that moral injury was showing up, right? And and I love that you brought forward this, this moral resilience, right? Where, because for the longest time, I thought accepting meant that I had to stand in the middle and scream that it was wrong, right? When, when nobody in the system was able to listen for whatever reason, you know, maybe perhaps they're experiencing moral injury or or what have you, right? Maladaptive coping tools from, from childhood coming in. And so thank you for the reminder that sometimes the acceptance is walking away from something dysfunctional, right? After 12 years. Um, and, and at the hospital, you know, my moral resilience did look like setting boundaries for myself next time I got pregnant and I'm pregnant now and advocating for what I need and being able to trust that intuitive voice, right? Like you were describing and forgiving myself, right? Self-forgiveness was at the root of being able to even listen to what my true understanding and my true nature was. Um, but perhaps most importantly, right, sharing my story with people who had earned the right to hear it in the She Recovers community, in a space that I did feel safe. And, and I'm really grateful that you brought forward kind of that, I can't remember the term, but kind of the combined humanity of, of realizing that I experienced moral injury at the hospital in terms of medical ne negligence and, and in the loss of my child because the people in the system were also experiencing moral injury, right? That it, it happened on the heel, you know, at the front lines of, of COVID. Um, and so of course, there's people who are, are working and navigating a overburdened and overwhelmed system, right? And so we were all in it together in the way that you described. And so when I was able to release some of that blame is when I really started to heal. Um, so we've got some, I, I could go on and on because I just, it's unbelievable how remarkable, some, you know, remarkably similar these stories are, but I've got some great, great questions here. Um, the first one I have is if I'm experiencing moral injury at work as a nurse and I feel powerless to make a change within this system, what might my moral resilience look like? So I think I might have kind of actually answered that in my personal experience, but right. what might a nurse's moral resilience look like if they feel powerless to make a change within their environment? I would say uh, if you are in a situation of moral injury and you don't, you feel powerless, right? Like what can I do? Uh, and at that point, what is your resilience? Your resilience is uh, telling at least, I mean, first of all, I, I wouldn't, uh, say your power, you, you don't have that power, you do have that power because once you start to sh share how, how uh, you're affected with the situation, how this is causing you more injury to, to the next person, then the next person. And this way, when you make a, like a cloud, that way you are actually throwing your voice out there and gradually you will be able to see that it's going to go uh, to the authority and authority would be probably able to do something. And the way you show your resilience is you, you just don't stay quiet there. Like you're going through something and staying quiet won't give you anything. Speak up, start to share that uh, to your colleagues. And this is something very like similar that happened uh, in a place where I had my internship with so most of the time, when we see something, we think resilience means just accept it and sit down and do nothing. But resilience doesn't mean accept it and sit down and do nothing. Resilience means you accept it and you act upon it. And how do you act upon it? You act upon it by, this is my way of doing that, share your story, share what you have. Wow, that's that so powerful. Thank you so much. I mean, I learn, I learn a lot from that as well, and I'm not a nurse. So what I'm hearing is having a voice, right? That it doesn't mean just standing in the middle and, and accepting everything as it is. So thank you. For yeah, that. Because most of the time we think resilience means just accept it. Like we're being, uh, somebody is abusing me like emotionally and we're like, oh, we're resilient, but no, that's not resilient. Resilience and silence, these are two different words. Right. So the next question does come with a bit of a, a trigger warning, perhaps, in how we answer this question, but they're asking, how can one heal and create resilience when in an emotionally and mentally abusive relationship with no financial means of leaving? So it sounds like perhaps for this person, leaving at the time is not an option, and they're curious to know how they can create that resilience within their current landscape. Oh, I'm, I mean, I'm, that's a very traumatic situation because the external forces 
also not working here, but I'm sorry to hear that. But somebody who isn't who, like who's financially challenged and some someone else is emotionally abusing, I would again say the same thing, right? Maybe you, you can't be able to go out of that relationship right away, but create a buzz, like gradually take that out. And just if you can't go out of the relationship because of the financial challenge, doesn't mean that you have to be quiet and get take all this pain create a community sometimes community help like same people same platform bring in people share and sometimes the, those people can actually help you with many different ways and um, make you more resilient uh, in where you are thank you so much yeah and we're sending love to that person and hope deeply hope that they can find a space where they do feel safe to share and connect in community as you've suggested right, right. Um, somebody else has asked, I'm struggling to understand the difference between moral injury and post-traumatic stress. In both situations, we see self-blame, harm ourselves with thoughts and actions, or qu question our resilience. So um, it's the same thing about, uh, some people have asked about like, what's the basic difference between moral injury and burnout as well. So here the difference. So when they're, they have the term moral injury, they kind of say that it can be it should be used for war situation because what 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 is the worst thing can happen in the world or in somebody's life a war but confining that term for war only i mean to me i feel like it's problematic so there is the difference is the intensity and the nature is what my answer is to you so that is also a traumatic situation but the difference is when it happens in a situation like a war, which I don't believe. And I argue that in my paper too. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, the next one is, are there any additional books or videos where I can learn more about moral injury or perhaps even a link to your direct study um, and how it occurs in ways that I can heal? I thought it was burnout, but from this presentation, it sounds like moral injury. So they're just looking for some additional resources. Got you. Uh, I mean, I do read some good articles, but once again, it's an, it's an emerging thing that you, you won't uh, hear moral injury until COVID hit. So everything was under moral distress, burnout. So uh, like this is how COVID, COVID become a blessing in this guy that people now started to talk about it. I would love to uh, share my um, contact with you um, if you want to know more about moral injury and some good articles, but I am not 100% um, sure about any book that, book that is totally targeted to moral injury, which is a good one to read. Perfect. Yes, we'd love to have access to um, the study that you did publish um, that, mm -hmm. I, that I found extremely helpful. I'll also say that there is a fellow, and I'm probably going to pronounce his name wrong, um, because again, I'm Lisa and I'm terrible at pronouncing people's names. Um, but he's got a couple of videos on YouTube. One of, one of them is called It's Not Burnout, It's Moral Injury. And his name is Dr. Zubin Damania on physical burnout. And then he also has a newer one um, in relation to COVID. So I'll just post both of those links here in the chat in a moment for folks to take a look at as well. Yeah, and uh, just to add to, um, like to give a little bit more clarification that moral injury is an experience. It's not anything a clinical diagnosis. So maybe this would help uh, people to understand uh, what's the basic difference between uh, burnout, PTSD, and moral injury? Absolutely. Um, the next question is, for me, I've struggled with confronting my lived experiences and embracing the emotions that come with those. What do you suggest for an academic activist who still hasn't confronted all of her demons, for lack of a better word? I feel imposter syndrome sometimes with my disability work and survivor work. Thank you for that. I mean, I would, again, just one thing I would 
be able to say that, just keep sharing your story until you get there. Yes, because it sounds like a practice, right? I, I know for me, I didn't suddenly overnight realize that I had this, you know, this type of injury and then I was instantly healed. It, it, it is kind of an unlearning, right, of some of those maladaptive coping tools as well. And so, again, I do wish for that person to have the space um, that they need to explore this in a way that feels safe and comfortable for them. Um, and we're so grateful that you're here and experiencing this session today. Um, somebody else has asked, and I'm also curious about this, is how does one work on their story? What suggestions do you have or how do I proceed? Okay, so for that, we have tons of, I mean, I have tons of resources that that's what the work I do with narrators. So uh, I would be happy to assist anybody to uh, work on their stories like we have some workshops that we call crafting your stories it's not like I'm going to craft your story but it's because it's your own story but we can help you with resources uh, which would um, help you to craft your stories and I actually Lisa I had I shared that with you I had a like bunch of questions so if I get the time I would work on someone's story if they want me to but we don't have that time hopefully someday we'll do that and you know what's so beautiful is actually just a couple of weeks ago, we had a session called The Healing Power of Storytelling in Community with Megan Perry and Mary Strong. And mm -hmm. so I just posted the replay to that as well. And you, and you might find it um, helpful also. But yeah, they really talked about the power of storytelling and how to do that again in a community where you feel safe, heard, mm -hmm. welcomed, and supported. And if you want, you can share that um, uh, discussion questions like the story uh, workshop that I wanted to do to the community. I mean, they can, um, I mean, those questions will definitely make them think. Of course. Well, I know that I've got lots more questions on my heart, but we have hit the top of the hour here. So we're going to have to pump the brakes, but I've seen so many wonderful comments as well in the Facebook feed and in this webinar. So please um, do take a moment to see just how your work is impacting this community. It's been, I can see it's been extremely helpful for everyone. And I think like you mentioned, we're only kind of scratching the surface of this iceberg. So I really look forward to continuing to follow the work that you do. Um, and the discoveries that you might make um, in, in, your, in your passion for this work. So we're so incredibly grateful, um, again, for your time and for your extensive knowledge on this topic um, and for being somebody who is kind of leading the charge. Um, it's very new, like you said, um, we're just learning about some of these new things. So I'm really grateful that you're at the helm guiding the ship and uncovering some of these really important truths for us. Um, Cause I can only see that it's obviously going to continue being an experience that people really need support and healing from. So thank you so much for that. Um, and, and of course, you know, for your, and for everybody who makes this series possible and thank you to our listeners for showing up and holding space today and bringing forward your questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please do feel free to post it on the Facebook feed um, so we can respond to you there. If there is any additional resources that you would like to share with our community, I'm happy to also add that to, to the event um, to live in perpetuity on our website. Next Monday, uh, we do have um, normalizing therapy, a discussion with uh, BetterHelp representative Heisu Joe. We're also gonna be joined by several members of our She Recovers community. And I'm not gonna tell you who they are because I, I, I don't wanna create any spoilers, um, but I'm very excited to have some beautiful souls uh, right here from volunteers to participants in our space to talk about um, at attending therapy and normalizing that experience. So please do join us for the next session of Mental Health Monday next week. Um, to learn more about this series, please visit sherecovers.org forward slash mental health Mondays. And of course, for more information about She Recovers Foundation and all of the recovery focused programs, resources and touch points, please visit www.sherecovers.org.